All right, welcome to the webinar today. I'm Laura Ferguson from the Kentucky Autism Training Center. Um, feel free to ask questions or make comments at any point throughout the presentation by typing your question in the question box and clicking send. If you cannot see the question box, click on the orange box with the right arrow in the upper right corner of your screen to open the question box area. I will be answering all questions at the end of the presentation. So welcome today. We're going to um, talk today about using functional communication training strategies to increase communication throughout the day. And we're going to look at this in all environments. So we may give some school examples, we may give some home examples, and we may just give some examples in general. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, it will kind of give you an understanding of what functional communication training is and how you can use this with the individuals in your home or in your school or that you interact with on a daily basis. So let's go ahead and get started. The, um, so as we look at the outcomes, we want to make sure that um, really when we're talking about functional communication training, that we're going to understand the deficits in communication for those individuals with autism. So we're going to talk a little bit about those deficit areas we see with individuals and why it's so important that we're looking at teaching communication and on top of that teaching functional communication. And then also we're going to do, um, introduce that functional communication training and understand those strategies and when and how you can put it in place with those in your everyday lives. All right, so first off, let's take a look at the autism diagnosis in the area of communication. We do know that with the autism diagnosis, we see that there are deficit areas in um, social communication and then there's those deficit areas and repetitive or stereotype behaviors. But for today's um, PowerPoint, we're going to be focusing on those deficit areas um, in communication because we're going to be talking about that throughout um, the remainder of the PowerPoint. So let's take a look at how individuals with autism, uh, those deficits with communication kind of come into play when we're looking at that diagnosis. So we see persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction um, with individuals with autism. So when we're taking a look at those deficit areas we may see with the diagnosis, first off we see that they're, they may have difficulty in what we call social emotional reprocessity, and that's that back and forth conversation. Sometimes with the diagnosis of autism, we see individuals who can label things in their environment or who um, can kind of echo things that they've heard. But where we see a lot of deficit areas with this diagnosis is in that back and forth conversation. The, hey, how are you? I'm fine, how are you? That back and forth that goes on between um, adults and peers. The other thing we may see um, with the diagnosis of autism in the area of social communication is um, they have trouble reading um, nonverbal cues and understanding those nonverbal non communicative behaviors. And that's very important in the area of both communication and social. You know, understanding, oh, I'm, I'm reading this cue so I know to continue to talk or I know that I may need to change the subject or I may be too close or I, I need to read those cues of others so that communication can continue and communication can be adequate between those individuals we are interacting with and also that we're displaying social interactions that are appropriate for our age range. The other thing that we see are deficits in developing and maintaining and understanding relationships. And as we know, we see that with individuals with autism, this social communication deficit, we're really looking at both those social skills and that communication. Um, and when we're thinking about it, we see those communication deficits, but we also see that social interaction deficit because if we're not focusing on communication and understanding how we can improve that, then we see that social are, that our social skills are also at a deficit. So as we see that, we see that individuals with autism have deficits in developing and maintaining those relationships. So as we look at that, we see those deficits with individuals with autism, but when we're looking at communication and autism, we see that deficits in nonverbal communication is one of the earliest signs of autism. We see that, you know, a lot of times parents will report that, you know, I, you know, I was wondering if my child was deaf because they really weren't interacting with me or following cues when I would say their name. So we see that that nonverbal communication is one of the earliest signs. 
And we also see that sometimes our individuals can talk or they can, they can talk, but sometimes it's not functional. And what I mean by that would be, you know, they can recite movies or they can, you know, kind of give quotes over and over or, you know, have what we call, sometimes call that TV talk where they're repetitively talking about movies and things out of movies, but sometimes they can't ask for things when they want them or request people to, you know, move away or stop tickling or tell people when something hurts. So we see with individuals with autism, that's one of those early signs is that deficit in nonverbal commu um, communication and that deficit in vocal communication. So when we see this, we see that we with individuals with autism, sometimes they have communication and we see that it starts to decrease or we see that that communication doesn't develop at all. So with these individuals with autism, communication is a key to teach further behaviors and also to teach um, those social interaction cues that we really work on with these individuals. So when we think about it and we're wondering, you know, why do we constantly bring up communication with individuals with autism? And really it's an importance and it's a foundation for the development of social behaviors, of play behaviors, of academic behaviors, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We see that communication is that foundational skill that they need to kind of develop all other skills within their environment. You know, so we'll be talking about how important communication is and as we look further into functional communication, we think back to how it's the foundation for the development of all these skills. And it also is appropriate communication to replace or prevent the, the development of those inappropriate communicative behaviors. And what we mean by communicative behaviors such as tantrum, self-injurious, aggression, is that a lot of times we see that Individuals may be engaging in these type of behaviors, such as tantruming, to communicate what they want or in engaging in a self-injurious behavior to communicate something that they want or need or aggression. Not all times, but sometimes we see that these are communicative behaviors. And, you know, if if I hit her, she might give me a cookie. So we see that aggression may continue because that's the way they learn to communicate. So we see that the, really communication is that foundation for the development of those appropriate behaviors as well as the um, development of those appropriate behaviors to then decrease the inappropriate behaviors. So when we're thinking about that and we talk about communication as that really foundation um, and the importance when teaching those skills, we often see that communication occurs with individuals with autism in the form of inappropriate behaviors. And we touched a little bit on that last side when we're looking at self-injurious or aggressive or, um, you know, um, when we see some individuals engage in a tantrum. And so when we're thinking about that, really we want to think about, you know, when we see those type of behaviors, are we missing something? Are these individuals with autism trying to communicate something to us and they really don't know how? And sometimes we see that they engage in that to communicate their wants or needs. You know, for example, if somebody comes over and gives them a hug and they don't want a hug and they engage in a tantrum, well, the next time somebody over, comes over to hug them, they might then fall to the floor. And so people go, oh, I shouldn't, I shouldn't go over there and give him a hug because then he might engage in a tantrum, which then the student goes, oh, if I just fall to the floor, I can get those people to then back away and not engage. And so we see that sometimes those behaviors are learned over time. And so if individuals can't communicate by saying, hey, I really don't want you to give me a hug, but if I then tantrum, you stay away, that may then be, that's my communicative response. I've learned to engage in a tantrum and then you stay away from me. So when we're thinking about it, we really have to put um, interventions in place that not only decrease those inappropriate behaviors, but what is going to replace those appropriate behaviors. And that's what we're going to talk about today, looking at functional communication training and how important it is to kind of decrease those behaviors that we see with individuals with autism. So let's look at let's take a look at this um, intervention that has been very effective and it's what we call functional communication training and let's take a look at the definition first functional communication training is a systematic practice to replace inappropriate behaviors 
or sub um, or communicative acts with more appropriate and effective communicative behaviors. So what we're re looking at here is we're first looking at what is that behavior that we are targeting for change? You know, so what are those behaviors where we may see an individual with autism who is who engages in aggressive behavior, or we see an individual with autism who en engages in maybe a self-injurious behavior, or they may engage in a tantrum. So we're looking at those behaviors that we um, are trying to target for decrease in their daily lives, and we're thinking about how we can then replace it with a more appropriate communicative response. When using functional communication training, um, teachers, practitioners, family members, parents, analyze the problem behavior to determine what the learner is trying to communicate. And this is very, very important. With um, our individuals with autism and individuals with other needs, we see that sometimes we may deem that they're communicating to, um, trying to communicate this or trying to communicate that, when really it's very, very important that we sit down and analyze what is he trying to tell me? Because if we don't effectively analyze what they're trying to communicate, then we may be then putting a practice in place that then increases the behavior. When really we want to think about putting that practice in place that reduces the behavior and then makes the appropriate behavior we're trying to replace more likely to occur. So I wanted to take a moment to just think about that. When we're thinking about functional communication training and we're thinking about how we can try to determine what they're trying to communicate to then replace the inappropriate behavior, a lot of times we see that individuals with autism engage in a behavior for a type of function. And what we see a lot of times with those functions are, for example, access to items. So say, for example, you have an individual in your home or your school or wherever you're working um, or wherever you're engaging with individuals with autism and they want, for example, an apple. So they've, they don't know how to ask for an apple, they don't know how to get the apple, but they've yesterday they came into the lunchroom or the kitchen um, and they wanted an apple and they came over and hit you and you're like, uh-oh, I know they need something, let me try to figure out what they need. So then the person goes over and, you know, goes through the guessing game. Do you want this? Do you need this? And then they got the, uh, and then they came to the apple and the student or child then gets the apple. So what we see there is that the child learns, hey, if I engage in hitting, somebody tries to make this environment more better, or, or better, I should say. Somebody tries to um, give me access to the items and activities I may want. So if I then engage in hitting, I get access to the items I want. We also may see that one of the functions we often see with individuals with autism or other disabilities is that they engage in a behavior for attention. So say, for example, um, you have an individual who doesn't know how to gain at in attention appropriately. You know, so they're kind of sitting there watching a movie all happy, you know, and receiving no attention whatsoever. But then once they go and pull sister's hair or brother's hair, then somebody comes over and says, hey, don't do that. That's not appropriate. We need to sit here and watch the movie. Well, what we then see is that an individual may say, hey, I didn't gain attention until I engaged in this behavior. So I then want to engage in this behavior to contact attention. So we may be looking at increasing those behaviors if we continue to reinforce them for engaging in that attention-seeking behavior. The other thing that we see uh, um, with individuals with autism is they may engage in behaviors in order to escape. You know, so I, I don't want to transition to this item or activity. I don't want to go here. So if I just fall to the floor, then that stops and I don't have to then go there any longer. So if I then, the next time you say, hey, get off the computer and come here, if I fall to the floor, then it doesn't happen and I get to lay on the floor and then sometimes even get back over to the computer. So we see that sometimes they engage in escape. If I just engage in falling to the floor, or running away or engaging in this, then I escape whatever you're making me go to. And then oftentimes we may see with individuals with autism what we call automatic reinforcement as a function of behavior. And that means there needs to be 
there has to be no other person present for them to contact the reinforcer. So oftentimes we may see this in the form of um, self-stimulatory behaviors where they may hand flap, they may rock, they may spin things, or they're getting that reinforcement not through anyone else, but with within themselves, they're getting that reinforcement by engaging in those behaviors that then automatically reinforce them. And so when we see this, oftentimes this is one of the most difficult behaviors to then decrease because they need no one else around them to contact that reinforcement. But they're getting that reinforcer when they're engaged sometimes in those um, self-stimulatory behaviors. So the reason we kind of veered away and I wanted to introduce you to the topic of and the definition of functional communication training, and then I wanted to veer off and teach you, talk to you about the functions is because it's really important that with functional communication training, we understand why the student, why and what the student is trying to communicate. So, you know, why does every time he wants an apple, he hits me? Or why does every time my child wants attention, they then, you know, pull my, their sister's hair instead of trying to contact her, her attention? And it's important that we understand these functions because then we can appropriately say, what is the communicative response I can then replace it with? So, for example, in the area of access to tangibles, you know, if the student or child wants an apple, and we have analyzed the behavior and said every time they want an apple, they engage in this behavior, then we can put into place teaching them or engaging with them how they can ask for the apple instead of screaming or hitting someone. You know, if, if um, our child or student wants attention, we can then say, okay, we've analyzed it and it looks like they're trying to gain attention from this. So we can then say, how can I teach them to get attention? So can we teach them to tap on a shoulder and say, excuse me, or, you know, or ask for attention from an adult or a peer? You know, if they want to escape, how can we then teach them to ask for an, a break or five minutes or teach them that at this moment we're going to do this and then we're going to do this first? Or if they're engaging in self stimulatory behaviors, can we teach them, you know, we can engage with this, but not at this moment or in this area and teaching them where it's appropriate. So it's very, very important with functional communication training that we're analyzing and looking at what is the function of the behavior so we can then put into place the appropriate communicative response. So with individuals with autism, if we want to appropriately replace those behaviors, we have to determine the function so we can effectively understand how to treat it. And if we don't treat it by the function, then we may strengthen those behaviors. So for example, if we, um, if we talk about the functions that we saw on the previous page, we saw, for example, that a student may, or a child may engage in behaviors for attention. Well, if we say, hey, I think he's doing it for access to items, we may then you know, give them more attention for it, and then they are actually doing it for access to items, or we may think they're doing it for access to items, but it's really attention. So we may treat that inappropriately, and the behavior continues to go on an upward tr trend. And we want to make sure that we understand the function, so it's very, very important with functional co communication training when we're thinking about using this technique that we sit down and analyze why the behaviors are occurring through looking at, you know, ABC charts, looking at, you know, what happens when the behavior occurs, what happens right before and what happens right after. So we can determine, hey, every time he wants an apple and he hits me, I then give him the apple. So he may want access to items, so I need to think about teaching him what he can do to gain access to that item instead of hitting me. So it's very, very important that we understand those functions of behavior to try to put into place that communicative response to replace those inappropriate behaviors. So for individuals with autism and other disabilities, it may not always be clear. Um, and we don't want to assume the behavior is occurring because of one reason, and it's really occurring because of another reason. So we may treat those behaviors incorrect incorrectly, and we may lead to strengthening those inappropriate behaviors. So we really want to make sure 
we're looking at that function before we try to put this in place to, in order to determine what communicative response we can use. All right, so when thinking about functional communication training, back to that definition of how we're determining and analyzing what is the function of the child's behavior and, and, and putting a communicative response in place to replace it, you know, thinking about why do we think this is such a powerful intervention tool for individuals with autism? And when we're thinking about that question, as we look back um, on the first um, PowerPoint um, slides, we saw where the deficit areas of an individual with autism was those social communication deficits. You know, and so when we see that that is a deficit area for these individuals, you know, communication and understanding how they can ask for their wants and needs, you know, is very, very important and a powerful, powerful tool to kind of teach these individuals with autism. And, you know, if we think back to a typically developing child, um, we see that, you know, the first things they tend to ask for are those items that they want. And so if we have individuals with autism who are engaging in behaviors at a high rate, then we see that, you know, they are trying to communicate to us, something to us at a high, high rate. So we need to think about how we can teach them to appropriately communicate their wants and needs. So, you know, that social communication is a deficit for our individuals with autism. But if we have behaviors that are occurring very, very frequently, they're trying to communicate to something to us. So we really want to make sure we're using functional communication training to teach them how, what it, how it's appropriate to um, communicate with those outside of themselves, how important it is to communicate not by hitting, but by asking for items they want or to decrease those tantrums and teach them that they can ask for a break or ask for attention. So we're teaching them those tools that will be very, very beneficial to them in the future. So if we're thinking about this, I wanted to put two slides in here to kind of talk about some things that we try to communicate on a daily basis, you know, and things that are very, very important when we're thinking about communication training for individuals with autism. You know, a lot of times we are communicating to individuals for a social convention, you know, so we're greeting others, we're, have, we're responding to others' names. So when we're thinking about that deficit area of individuals with autism, that social communication is such a big deficit. So these are all things that we really wanna teach them to communicate to others. Um, attention to self, getting the attention of others. You know, so teaching individuals with autism how to access attention. You know, whether it's tapping on shoulder, whether it's saying excuse me, whether it's, you know, raising their hand, but teaching them how to get attention. To reject or protest, very, very important. You know, um, a lot of times, we, we hear people say, well, he can say no perfectly. You know, it's getting him to say yes or to ask for things that he wants. But it's very, very important that we also teach individuals with autism that they can reject those non-preferred items by indicating no. But early, early on, we wanna teach them how to request those things they want, and then we'll start to teach them to, to um, reject or protest those things that they don't want. Um, requesting um, an object, obviously, is a highly communicative response that we want to make sure we're teaching. Requesting access to those preferred objects or activities. And through functional communication training, a lot of times, this is exactly what we're trying to do. Because um, when teachers or parents um, talk to me, they always talk about, you know, I know he wants the television, but he runs into the living room and falls to the floor. And then I'm like, okay, buddy, just calm down, I'll give you the television. So, you know, a lot of times are in thinking back to your life and how much you want to communicate um, that you want a preferred object or activity. And if our individuals that we are working with on a daily basis don't know how to do this, that's a, a skill that we need to teach them. To request an action, so request assistance. So these are all the things that, you know, they're trying, they may be trying to communicate, and we need to think about how we can teach them the appropriate way to do it. Request information. So requesting the name of an object or requesting clarification. Um, to request um, 
to comment about things in their environment. You know, to, for example, if they see a fire truck, you know, can they comment, oh, that's coming down the street? You know, those are things that are relevant that are happening in their environment. We want to make sure that they understand how they could alert their communicative partner about something that's changing or going on in the environment. Choice making, um, choosing between two or more alternatives, very, very important for our individuals um, on the autism spectrum. You know, um, they, they need the opportunities to have choices, but we need to teach them, you know, that you can decide between these two objects because that's a skill that they're going to need throughout their, their lives. Um, to answer, uh, you know, indicating yes or no, and this is a hierarchy skill. We don't start there, but we want to teach them, you know, you know, later on in life, you know, do you want this, yes or no? Um, and imitation, imitating to head nod for yes or no. So if we're thinking about individuals with autism and those communicative responses, these are things that they may need to understand how to communicate to us. Um, and so it's thinking about those expanded forms and those functions. So in our, a lot of times with functional communication training, these are the things they need to understand how to communicate or I, and what they're trying to communicate. So thinking back to functional communication training, you know, a lot of times if we're looking at that function, you know, um, when they need attention, when they um, want access to items, when they want to escape, these are some of the other things that we may notice that they're trying to communicate to us, but they don't know how, like, hey, notice me. So for attention, I need help, you know, and sometimes that revolves around that access to items. I need help to access this activity. I don't want that, um, you know, so that goes back to the protesting. Um, they may engage in hitting because they don't know what something is and they just want clarification. So what is that? Um, access to items, I want that one. Or, you know, we may see some self-injury when something's wrong. You know, they can't communicate that my head hurts or that happened. And so I engage in this because, you know, this is going on and I can't communicate to you that something is happening in my environment that I'm not fully aware of. So when we're thinking about functional communication training, let's take a look at some examples. And I'm going to give you some examples that have happened in um, – my daily lives when interacting with individuals with autism, and I'm sure you have some examples as well um, that you feel free to ask towards the end of the PowerPoint, any questions you may have. But let's just take a um, look at this one. Um, I worked in a classroom. Um, we had an individual who really, really engaged in some destructive behaviors when the computer would freeze up or wouldn't work. So what would happen was he would go over to the computer. Um, it, if it took too long, the computer would either end up on the floor and we, we had several broken computers. So what we had to do is we thought, okay, we took some data, we analyzed the behavior and we said, okay, what happens when the computer ends up on the floor? So after looking at the data, we, we saw that the student really needed help and needed clarification on how to navigate when the computer didn't do what he needed. So what we put into place was we taught the student how to ask for help. Now, one of the really important things about functional communication training is we have to get on top of the behavior. So after we analyzed it, we wanted to make sure we didn't chain inappropriate behaviors with appropriate behaviors. And what I mean by that is we didn't want to go over to the student and after he'd already knocked the computer on the floor, go over and say, that's not nice. What do you need to ask for? You need to ask for help. Because then the student may chain it with, if I just knock this on the floor, somebody will come over and try to make this better. So what we did is we contrived situations to teach this skill. So for example, when the student was in the classroom and he then gained access to the computer, we went over and turned the computer off to where he didn't know how to turn it back on. Um, and so what we would do is we'd stand close to him, we'd say, okay, you can go have computer time. He went over there. Before he would, could throw it on the floor and was getting upset, we would prompt him to sign help. So he would look at us, someone was close to him, he'd sign help, and, and at first we had to hand over hand, prompt him to sign help, and then we go, oh, you need help, let me help you, and we would turn on the computer. 
So what we did is we contrived opportunities to teach this throughout the day. And what we started to see is that we gradually faded ourselves back on those opportunities and we found that the student would turn to us, sign help, and then we'd come over and help him. So with functional communication training, what we're doing is we see that we have a student who may engage in what we deem as inappropriate behaviors or behaviors that we want to target for reduction. And we say, what, you know, what was he trying to communicate? And he was trying to communicate to us that he needed help, but he didn't know how to do it. So what we did was we prompted him to sign help um, and to reduce that screaming and knocking those items over on the floor. And then we taught him what he could do instead of that, and then it increased his asking for help and decreased him screaming and throwing the computer on the floor. The other thing with functional communication training is you want to make sure that the communicative response that we're trying to replace the inappropriate behavior with is something that is not more difficult to do than the target behavior. And um, you want to make sure that you can teach that within the repertoire. For this student, he had started with some sign language um, and help was one of those that we were working on. So he understood um, sign language. So we wanted to put that in place to replace those inappropriate behaviors. If we had to go in and teach this throughout the process and it wasn't something that um, he was able to do, for example, if you just put a device in front of a kid and they have no idea how to use it, well, that's more difficult than engaging in just knocking the computer off. So we want to make sure that we this skill is something that can be taught in that moment to replace that inappropriate behavior. Let's take a look at another example. So reinforcing a student for handing a picture card to a peer um, and requesting a toy instead of grabbing it. And this happens a lot. Um, in you know my home in um, in the school setting if we're looking at younger children but you know we um, in my scenario I had a, a student who wanted always wanted a toy um, from their peers he had no idea how to ask request those toys from the peer so what we did is again we this happened um, at a pretty high rate. We had about four to five times a day, um, but we wanted to contrive those opportunities to teach it more. So what we would do is we'd have a peer and this peer, and we would have the student engage with a toy. So the student would show interest in that toy. So what we would do is before he could grab it, we would teach him to then give the student a picture card or say, airplane please, or whatever they were asking for. Then once the student, we prompted the student to say that, we would then have the other student um, give them the toy. Now we set up this situation because we didn't want the students to all feel like, oh, I have to give up my toys all the time. But we would work with them to kind of contrive those situations where we could work on him requesting it instead of just grabbing it out of his hand. And again, the reason that we set up this scenario is because all too often what we see happen is that a, a student or a child will go up and take something from somebody and we go, that's not nice. What should you have done? And we say, you know, ask them, can I have it, you know, and so we may chain those inappropriate behaviors together. So they've already grabbed the toy out and now we're having them ask for it. So we're doing that backwards. So we want to make sure that we teach the student what they do and if they can access it. Now, pretty soon on, we also taught them that sometimes they this, the child was not willing to give it up as well, but that went in later. So that's why we contrived those opportunities to teach them that if you ask for it, you get the item or activity you want at this point. All right, another example that we are going to look at is reinforcing a student for saying excuse me to gain attention from an adult instead of hitting. Another example of um, something that we worked on a lot with a student, we had a student that um, when a teacher would walk by would just swat at them, you know, and so when analyzing this behavior, what we saw is that we saw over time that the student really wanted attention from the adult and teacher that was walking beside them. So what we taught this student to do who was vocal and had some echoic responses was when the student wanted attention from an adult, 
we would have the adult in close pro proximity. We would see him um, turn towards the teacher. And so someone would prompt him to say, excuse me, and he'd go, excuse me. And the teacher would then walk over and give him attention. So what we also wanted to make sure happened is that if he did reach out and hit her, that the student, that the student didn't get attention for it. But we wanted to contrive those opportunities to teach the skill. And again, I hope you're hearing um, me say throughout these examples, is you have to teach these skills. We want to make sure that they understand. We don't want to make sure in the height of ex of escalation or when it's already happened that we're thinking back, oh, I really should have contrived this situation to ask for it. So we want to we want to contrive those opportunities to teach the skill so that we can see, the student can see how effective it is to communicate their wants and needs and instead of engaging in these inappropriate or target behaviors. So um, the great thing about this is um, the student started to say excuse me on a daily basis. We did see an increase of excuse me a lot. So then we paired excuse me with, you know, raising your hand and teaching other skills to get a, gain attention as well. But um, the student then started to say excuse me and then use a name. So we expanded language with that as well. So I hope that um, those, those scenarios kind of um, showed you a little bit about functional communication training. And one of the other examples I always talk about that I'll bring up that um, is not on a slide is I had a student who really, really loved to smell um, other students' hair. So um, this student was in a preschool classroom and we were really trying to determine what we could do um, to replace the, ha the hair pulling because what would happen is the student would go over and smell hair but then would pull on the student's hair to smell it even closer, which made the other students cry and upset. Well, for this student, what we looked at is we said, finally, this student is trying to communicate something um, to the other students and what it is is, you know, I'd like, I like the way you smell, I wanna smell your hair. And so what we did is we, prompted the student to sign hug um, and the student would give others a hug and and um, then he would kind of take a whiff of their hair. So what it looked like was the students, we had reduced the hair pulling of the other students by teaching him to sign to ask for a hug. Um, and so what we saw is that the student increased asking for a hug and decreased the hair pulling. Uh, the student actually um, started to say hug within a couple weeks because he was so motivated to give the students hugs. What had happened in the past with him was they would put him in time out. So he'd give a hug or he'd pull hair to kind of smell their hair um, and they'd say, no, that's not okay, go sit in time out. So the student was spending a, a lot of time in time out for this behavior. So we wanted to teach him how he could appropriately um, interact with the students. Now this was a preschooler, so hugging was appropriate, but we wanted to make sure we taught him a communicative response to replace that inappropriate behaviors. So when we're thinking about functional communication training, looking at this, we see that, you know, the form of communication, it doesn't matter. Whatever they're trying to communicate, and the function is usually what they're requesting or what we call manding, that motivation behind those requests. So in the forms, we see that um, individuals with autism may gesture, they may sign, they may use vocal words, they may have picture systems such as PECS, which is picture exchange communication, um, where they get a card and request using those cards. We may see that they have objects that they request with or technology. That's where we may see some of those devices. No matter the form, usually what we see is the function of it is I'm trying to request something. And thinking back to those functions that we saw, they're requesting attention. They're requesting you know, access to items. They're requesting to escape an item or activity. So we see a lot of times that no matter the form, a lot of times the function is those requests or mans. So the advantages with functional communication training is you see a dramatic decrease in challenging behavior if you implement it to fidelity. Um, it does increase communication, which is a deficit area, um, as we saw back to thinking about the autism diagnosis in the area of autism. There is a lot of social validity to it, meaning that, you know, um, individual see as, as an effective tool because across the board, if a kid's communicating more and the um, inappropriate behavior is decreasing, um, 
and that increases buy-in from it, correct? Because people are seeing, oh, this is working. You know, we no longer have hair pulling, but we have a student who's requesting this or that. Um, and the gains last. If students start to see that my language work works versus my inappropriate behaviors, we start to see an increase in language. The disadvantages is a high rates of reinforcement, so we have to make sure that we are using that those reinforcement techniques. Um, and thinking to, to reinforcement, we want to make sure that we're, um, again, looking at the function of it so we can reinforce it appropriately. Um, the request may occur at inconvenient times, and I always say when you're first teaching functional communication training, we may see a high rate of request. Well, that's we have to at first say, I'm okay with you getting reinforcement at this high rate because I don't want you to go back and revert to the inappropriate behavior. Um, and so we may see also that um, extinction, which means no longer reinforcing, may um, have some undesirable effects, but we don't always see that with functional communication training. Usually when we understand the function of the behavior, then we start to say, okay, he's doing this for access to items, so I'm teaching him how to access those items. So we see an increase in that communication. So um, when we're talking about functional communication training, one of the big pieces of this is that motivation. So we want to make sure that whether you're, we're using words, signs, pictures, um, we want to make sure that whatever we're trying to teach them is that motivation level. So we're understanding what the individual is trying to communicate. Um, so we want to make sure that we're using that motivation to our advantage to teach that language. So whether they're trying to communicate, you know, um, I really want attention, you know, I really want um, access to items. They are motivated for those things. So it's important that we think about the motivations high, teaching them to either acquire that word or use that device to get the items and activities that they want. So we want to make sure that the communication we're teaching is functional for them. Um, we want to make sure that we're using things that um, are based upon their preferences, so looking at the function of the behavior and understanding it. Um, and we also want to make sure it's meaningful to them as well, that we're looking at why they're engaging in those behaviors um, and what communicative response they're attempting to engage in and how we can uh, um, use that language to our to increase appropriate responses and decrease those inappropriate responses. So matter, no matter what the form of communication, we can always work on increasing communicative responses. So these last couple of slides I wanted to talk through, you know, with we're thinking about communication and functional communication training, we can always attempt to recre uh, increase um, communication. And one of the things that we can do is by teaching those echoics. And, you know, sometimes with our students who are vocal, we might not understand them in the beginning. You know, we might have kids who are, we want to replace hitting with requesting um, an apple, but they can't fully say apple, correct? And so they might go apple and we can, or apple, and we can't understand it. So with individuals with autism, you know, we may see babbling, we may see sounds emitted or words, um, and so we want to make sure that we kind of shape up those echoics to um, increase language. You know, so we may see first that we see echoics are not always under our control, but you, we see that, you know, when he wants computer, he may babble about something and it doesn't sound like computer. So we may see that, you know, at first, if, you know, he hits to gain access to a computer, we we then put in place, we're going to teach the, a functional communication training to get access to that computer. So what we then do is we may say, when he wants computer, I'm going to contrive a situation to where he can ask for it. So he comes up and he goes, uh-uh. And you go, oh, you want computer? You can have computer. Well, and everybody else in the environment would go, that doesn't sound like computer. What are we doing? So we may want to make sure we're shaping those up those echoics to then sound more and more like computer. So working on these um, skills outside and in isolation is a very, very good idea. You know, um, a lot of times when I'm in classrooms and home settings, um, uh, one of the things that we may want to do is get these under what I call echoic control. You know, so. Um, for example, if you're jumping on a trampoline with your um, 
son or daughter and you know they're going ah, 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 and you're like oh wow I'm, I'm hearing some babbling words you know trying to get those under a code control by saying if they're already saying ah, 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 and you go say ah well they were probably already in that um already in that kind of a coic response so they're going to say it anyways but you put that say in there and then they say ah you can get those skills under control of the sd you know of the of the demand and so what we see is that you may get some imitation skills going on there and then you can use that when you're trying to increase and teach communication and we also also see that um, teaching sign language um, you know if we're going to use some sign language to replace those disruptive behaviors or aggression um, we see that um, sign language is a great tool to use and PECs and devices doesn't matter but we want to make sure that if we're going to use sign language that we think about you know is it in the students um, or the child's repertoire um, are they easy to teach are they going to be easy to replace those inappropriate um, behaviors um, the advantages is it develops motor um, imitation um, it's topography based like speech and meaning that we see the the movement with the language um, and we also see that we can teach it across all language and their hands are always available to them we also see that some advantage disadvantages of it is parents and teachers must learn it and one of the big things with functional communication training is that we're teaching this to fidelity so you know whether they're doing this um, we're trying to contrive those situations and teach those replacement communicative responses at home or school we want to make sure this generalizes so we want to make sure if we're going to use PECS or we're going to use sign or we're going to use vocal language whatever communicative response we're going to use to replace those inappropriate behaviors that across everyone they understand those signs and how to use them um, so when we're thinking about language and how we can increase that with individuals make sure that you're start by teaching those mans those things that are really really motivating for them and when we're looking at functional communication training and we've decided okay that's what we're going to do because he always every time he, he wants the television every time he wants my attention every time he wants a toy he engages in these inappropriate behaviors that we want to decrease um, and that's where we see okay he is motivated for these items and activities that's where we're going to start we're going to try to teach him those communicative response to get access to items and activities so make sure if you have a student or a child or someone that you're working with that if they are engaging this then you know they're motivated for getting that item or activity we need to start and make sure that we're use teaching them appropriate language and um, that they're not gaining access to it by engaging in these inappropriate behaviors so kind of wrapping up before we take questions one of the most important things we could teach individuals with autism is that ability to communicate um, and we want to make sure that you know I always say can pick those systems and work with the individual to make sure you're using a system that is appropriate for this uh, the child or the student you know um, give them input into the system that they're going to use whether it's Packs or a device or whether it's um, you know vocal language or whether it's sign or whatever system they're using be consistent and make sure it's available to them across all environments and the reason I say this is because with functional communication training you know we're trying to decrease inappropriate behaviors um, and replace them with a a communicative response so if that communication system is not available to them across all environments we may see where individuals engage in behaviors in certain environments and not in all and then we're trying to communicate we're trying to work on a behavior that doesn't happen across all environments because it doesn't happen when the communication system is available but it does here and we want to make sure we're not taking those words from an individual with autism and we want to make sure that is available to them all the time <laughs>